This whole thing started with Jim having a vision and sending me a, an email with just a whole bunch of thoughts. Um, and it, it stems from, um, in, in part, it stems from January 6th. Um, and the, the commingling of, of the former president's name, the Confederate flag, and the presence of Jesus's name all mingled together. Um, and as Jim very wisely put it, this was not um, a one-time event. This was simply the most glaring eruption of a disease in the majority culture church in America. And um, we've just been moved by the Lord to do something, um, but what? <laughs> Um, and, um, long and short of it, we've been removed, we've been moved, um, to repent, um, to repent personally and in the spirit of Ezra and in the spirit of Daniel, um, and frankly, in the spirit of Jesus, our savior to repent on behalf of our people. Um, so, uh, I asked Jim and I talked and he, he's going to share what the vision is. And then I've asked Beth as well to share after Jim, um, why we're doing this during Lent, what, what Lent is and what Lent isn't. Not everyone here serves, uh, you know, comes from a Lenten tradition. I, I know I didn't. Um, so, um, and then, and then I'll talk a little bit about like what we're doing, uh, logistically ourselves, and then what we're inviting anyone who wants to pastor, leader, believer, follower of Jesus, whatever, can come come join us. So this is what we're going to do. So Jim, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, I mean, Ma Matthew set it up really well. So we, you know, we, we all know what happened on, on uh, January 6th. And I think um, seeing Jesus's name uh, uh, it, it involved in all of that, uh, it, you, you, you know, it was just just utterly devastating. Just utterly devastating, and 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 when they whenever you see, I think we all know this. When when you see catastrophic moral failure in an individual Christian, or in a movement or in a group, it's not like a one-off thing, right? It's not just like it, it it doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? There's a story that leads up to it, um, and there's a horrible story that follows from it, and so uh, I just found myself deeply burdened um and some of it was tied to the fact that 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 there were people involved in in some of this and implicated in some of this that like has had influence in my life you know that 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 like and and has influence on people who are near to me and and so um it just became increasingly clear and and it, it didn't start uh, there but it, it, this clarity has been growing for years now that that the church especially the white church in the united states is just um uh, not bearing the fruit that indicates closeness with jesus and so what do we do in that in that moment and that's in a sense the question that, that we're asking and we're asking god to address within us but but at least part of the question uh part of the answer takes us to to um matthew chapter 7 where jesus says when you see this speck in your brother's eye uh look for the plank that's in your own eye so it seems to me that whenever god begins or works a renewal movement within the church both biblically and in the history of the church it begins not just not simply with uh with, with a group of people saying look pointing to somebody else and saying look look, look at the terrible sin that's out there um, we see the sin that's out there, and then we say, Lord Jesus, address the sin that's in here, and probably the sin that I can't see. And that's part of the thing that 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 really scares me. I'm scared of the sin I can't see about myself. I'm scared of the sin I can't see within myself. I'm scared of the idols I run to that I'm not even aware of, Edwin. <laughs> it's It's not so much the sin I'm already broken about, that concerns me. It's the sin I ha that has it that I'm not broken about. That's the one that really will ruin me forever, and will ruin our church forever, and will ruin uh, and will undermine uh, the advance of the kingdom in the nation. And so, 
um, it seems to me that the Lord uh, brings us to repentance. And then our minds went to uh, Acts chapter 9, because in Acts chapter 9, when uh, Jesus confronts Saul on the road to Damascus, that is a beautiful moment of what it looks like when Jesus removes the plank out of somebody's eye. Saul was a well-intentioned, horrible sinner, a well-intentioned, happy sinner. Like he wasn't looking, he wasn't even looking for repentance. He was he was really happy at what he was doing, and he was a violent extremist and all of those sorts of things. And so it but what happens is Jesus gets in his way. And that's where the phrase comes from that we've been that we've been kind of hanging out with. I want Jesus to get in my way. I want Jesus to get in the way of my church. I want Jesus to get in the way of the church. I want Jesus to get in the way of majority culture church in America. Jesus, please get in my way. And when Jesus gets in Paul's way, he kindly said, well, he, he, for, for first he says, why are you persecuting me? Remember, which teaches us the spiritual unity of the church. Uh, when, when, whenever there's a sin against a portion of the church, it's a sin against Jesus because we are all spiritually united to Jesus. And one of the things that, that means, of course, is that Jesus is the final victim of all our sin against each other and, and in the world. And Jesus, Jesus confronts Saul and then he kindly blinds him, which I take it to be a way of teaching, showing, giving him spiritual sight by showing him his spiritual blindness through physical blindness. Um, he kindly blinds Saul. And then Jesus kind of leaves him in the tension and then goes and calls Ananias, who Ananias is one of the targets of Saul's sin, violence. Saul was planning on getting Ananias, if not by name, guys like him. And, and Jesus reaches out to him and says, Ananias, I want you to go to, to Saul. Saul needs to hear the gospel through the mouth of the people that he was uh, planning to perpetrate wickedness against. And so uh, Jesus calls Ananias, this wonderfully courageous thing Ananias does. Jesus calls Ananias to go and to proclaim the gospel to him and to pray for him and to bring healing to him, both physical healing and spiritual healing and then baptism. And then what you get at the end is Paul. You get Paul, you get Paul, the great proclaimer of the gospel, the one who wrote Ephesians chapter two and Galatians chapter three and, 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 and all of the beautiful doctrine that we get. Um, and so I want Jesus to get in our way. We want Jesus to get in our way and to do whatever it takes, Jesus, be it ever so severe, do whatever it takes in us, through us, among us, um, to get us to a place where, uh, where planks are taken out and we can be a true gift to the wider church and to the world for the glory of Jesus Christ and for the extension of his kingdom. And so that's kind of what, what we're on about. And there's a lot more that can be said, but Beth has more has once they tell us about Lent. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jim. Every time I hear you talk through that, I, I I get a little bit more convicted at my own need to to see those idols that I don't know about and to rip them down. And I, and I, I sense that that is going to be the theme of of this process um, for me at least. Um, and I pray for for all of us. We we, we talked. As a, as a small group about Lent, and, and, and the question came up, why Lent? And I thought it might be a good idea just to kind of approach that and, and explain that to you, because I grew up in a Baptist um, context, in a Baptist tradition. Lent was something we looked at with a little bit of suspicion, and um, it felt like a works-based uh, thing to do in order to receive grace. And so I have I have in the last several years been sort of embraced by a contemplative tradition that is that is that has changed my mind about that. Um, Lent is about solidarity more than anything else. It's it's not a, a medieval uh, effort of doing penance, but it is in fact it's repentance. And I'm really struck that, um, you know, Lent is based loosely on Jesus's 40 days in the wilderness. And I think Jesus could have done whatever he wanted to do being God, but instead he took his time and he went into the wilderness and, and he, he had 
what in my um, Pentecostal background would call carpet time with God to, 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 to get with God. And, and we're called to do the same in the church. Um, in the church historic, in the ancient church, we see the, the fast of Lent show up very pretty early on, like in, in, in about the second or third century. And what it was, was a time of preparation for the catchments, for those converts who were going to be baptized. They, baptisms were held on Easter Sunday at midnight during the Easter vigil. And converts would go through three years of being taught before they were finally baptized and invited to their first Eucharist meal on Easter Sunday. So in these last 40 days leading up, they would go into a time of fasting and contemplative practices and, and extended teaching to prepare themselves. And the rest of the congregation would, in solidarity, join with them in the fast. Um, not only to walk with them, but to recall their own baptismal vows. Um, no matter what, what tradition we come from, when we're baptized into the body of Christ, we um, turn our back on sin, we turn our back on the enemy. And I don't know about you, but, but praying the sinner's prayer has not fixed the sin in my life altogether. I have to keep going back and I have to keep walking through. Um, times of repentance. Repentance means metanoia is the Greek word. It means turning the other way. It doesn't mean kicking off a checkbox. And so this, this time, this 40 days of fasting um, is much more than just punishing ourselves for being sinners, but it's creating space. And when as you spoke to, it's creating space in our lives to give to other things. Perhaps the money that would be saved from skipping a meal or from fasting for a day would then be given to the poor. Um, perhaps the time that's freed up by taking time out from, from whatever you choose to fast on is given then to time in the word, time with the Lord. Um, that's why Lent. We're, we're not doing it to gain favor or to do a performative action um, that says, see, we're, we're, we're good. But instead, we recognize that if it, I think if it took Jesus 40 days in the wilderness to prepare for his ministry, it's going to take us a whole lot of lengths, you know, to continuously continue to the cross and allow him to get in our way and shine light on, on the places in us that he wishes to redeem. It's beautiful, Beth, thank you. Um, yeah, so as we, as we were reflecting, just given church history and how this season of Lent certainly can be abused to being a, a time of you know, whipping oneself, uh, I'm reminded, I was thinking this morning about the Collect for Ash Wednesday that begins I remember it correctly, uh, oh God, um, who, who hatest nothing that thou hast made. Um, God, God, which is sort of an upside down way to say he loves us, but it's a little bit striking too, right? Because uh, in a season of repentance, it's easy to forget that God doesn't hate us. He loves, his goodness leads us to repent. So, um, so I'm dropping here in the chat window, yeah, sort of the, the summary of what we're seeking to do in this season is to listen, to lament, and to look to Jesus. Uh, for time's sake, I'm not going to, you know, say a, a whole bunch of stuff, but there's a bunch of websites, which those didn't look like those linked. So if Beth or Jim, if you could help me out with uh, putting clickable links there and feel free to look at them. Um, the first link there kind of summarizes what we've been thinking, and, um, and then there's a Facebook group, there's a Twitter handle, and then, um, the, uh, and then I'll get to the last one in a second. But basically, here's, here's what we're doing and what we invite you to do with us if you are so moved. And, you know, your congregation, any, anyone you know that would be interested in this. Um, again, we're, this is, we just feel compelled to do this and we feel compelled to invite whoever wants to join us. So three things. First, Wednesdays, uh, beginning tomorrow uh, for the season of Lent. On Wednesdays, we are going to fast um, 
from something, food or something else, but take that time that we would have done in that other activity and um, devote it to prayer about this. And then also on Wednesdays, um, we are going to gather at noon, just like this in a Zoom meeting uh, for an hour to pray together with whoever wants to, to join us. Uh, for each of these, we are inviting a leader of color to come share their heart, share the scriptures, share a story, share whatever they want to say, because, and this is because we want to assume the posture of, of listening um, in this season. We don't want to assume that we know what it is that we're supposed to repent of, either personally or corporately, um, but we want um, leaders to speak in. So uh, I'm really excited tomorrow, uh, Drew Jackson at Hope's Church East Village uh, is going to be sharing. He's gonna read one or two of his poems uh, from his forthcoming book and then share some, some of the story behind uh, the poem he or two he picks. And then after about 20, 25 minutes, we're just going to go right to prayer together. Um, so we'll do that every Wednesday. Uh, Edwin is, has graciously agreed to join uh, another week. Um, Danae Pierre is going to be joining us uh, as well. Uh, and so all throughout these six weeks, we, just, we want to be in a posture of listening. So Wednesdays, there's a fast uh, that we'll do on our own. And then a midday uh, prayer time over Zoom. Secondly, on Fridays, uh, and maybe more often, but at least on Fridays, through email and social media channels, uh, we're going to push resources out. Um, sermons, talks, podcasts. Again, uh, we, we felt very, we, we recognize, I, I had, had lunch uh, with a pastor yesterday, uh, African, Caribbean, American, uh, here in Brooklyn, and um, we recognize that there is there is an an understandable exhaustion from leaders of color on this topic, and we did not want to go ask all of our friends, "Hey, would you provide just more content for us uh, who aren't getting it over here?" Um, we we wanted to, we we wanted to do the work of saying, "Hey, the content is all there. Like we just need to put ourselves in the way of it, so that again we can listen." and lament and look to Jesus. So on Fridays in particular, we're gonna be pushing things out like that through social media and email and encouraging whoever is joining us on this journey uh, to listen or watch it over the weekend and to discuss and with one another through social media. Um, and again, just inform our repentance together. So Wednesdays, fast prayer meeting. Fridays, we'll push um, resources out the third thing we're 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 all we the, the six of us have committed to do uh is we're all reading a book written by a leader of color um and we've all picked actually i think we've all picked different books come to think of it uh but we compiled a list uh and it's i mean it's like a starters list there's so many books that could have been added to the list and even when i finished i'm like we could put another 20 on here just like at the drop of a hat but um we put the ones like, these are the ones we were reading. And these are some of the first ones that came to mind. If you don't know where to start, like if you don't have a, a book or a shelf of books staring at you on this topic uh, in, in your library, pick one of these. And it, it's, a, it's a wide range. Some are pastors, some are theologians, uh, some may not even be Christians. But again, adopting the posture of a listener uh, so that we can be informed of the violence that the majority culture church has been doing in America, not just January 6th, but most glaringly erupting on January 6th. What is what, what are we repenting of and how are we listening, lamenting through that, looking to Jesus? And yes, repentance is a turning to new actions and new ways of being. And we were mindful of this, even in preparing this, like what, what are the new actions? And ultimately we, we said, um, we know, but we don't know. Um, we, 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 we want to, for a season, adopt a position of listening for the spirit, listening to leaders of color, and not just assume at the outset of this that we know what those steps of repentance will be. But our intention is uh, Jesus getting in our way uh, and transform us, um, transform your church. Because as Jim pointed out, we have solidarity with our brothers and sisters of color, 
who have been set on the margins uh, ecclesiastically, theologically, socially, and strangely enough, and this is harder to admit, we also have oneness with Jesus, with the people whose actions we deplore <laughs> on January 6th, um, for those there who truly know our Lord. Um, oneness goes both ways. Um, and so seeking to be eager to maintain that spirit wrought crazy unity and praying that the kingdom would come in us and just start with us, start with me um, and lead, lead us to repentance. Um, so that's, that's, that's what um, we're doing. And we welcome anyone who wants to join us, uh, particularly majority culture pastors and believers. Um, we're not asking uh, minority churches, like you need to repent of our sins, so to speak. But particularly if that, if that describes you, if your heart resonates with it, we invite you to join.